Hi, good morning, and welcome to The Crossing. Um, we're so glad you're able to join us this morning for our online service. Um, would you just bow with me in a word of prayer before we get started? Um, God, our Father, this morning we praise you for being our God and our Father, um, for being the one we can depend on day in and day out, um, for loving us so much and um, for all the blessings that you give us, God. We thank you. Um, so this morning we pray that we can help you can help us to um, just praise you from the bottom of our hearts um, and just give you the praise and the glory and the thanks uh, that you deserve, God. So we pray this all in your son's name.
has been celebrated by the Christian church for hundreds of years. The word Advent comes from Latin and means arrival. Like other Christians throughout history, we will read scriptures and light candles four weeks before Christmas and anticipate Christ's coming. The Advent wreath is shaped in a circle. The circle reminds us of God's unending love and the greenery reminds us of the everlasting life we have in Jesus. Each week we will light a candle on the wreath. The purple candle represents repentance. A pink candle is lit on the third week of Advent to symbolize the joy of anticipation that Christ is coming soon. Finally, the white candle is in the center of the wreath, is the Christ candle. It is traditionally lit on Christmas Day. This is the first Sunday in the Advent season. This week's theme is prophecy. As we light this candle, we remember how the Old Testament prophets prophesied about the coming of the Christ child. Long before Christ was born, the prophet Isaiah prophesied that God would send a Savior to the world. We believe that Jesus fulfills this prophecy. Many prophets foretold the coming and the manner of the coming of Christ. They waited with great anticipation for the glad day when God would send his Messiah into the world. Isaiah 9, 6-7 for unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from the time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Let's pray. O oh God, light and wisdom comes from you. Thank you that you are a God who is faithful to keep all your promises. You told your people for many generations that you would send the one who would come to set your people free. And you are true to that promise through the sending of your son, Christ Jesus, who sets us free from the slavery and penalty of sin. We glorify your name in all the earth. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Pastor Josh here. I'm coming to you from Tim and Betty Sang's backyard as we uh, get ready to baptize uh, a member of our church this morning. And very excited to have you join us. As you know, as we talk about baptism, uh, Thanksgiving is probably the 
one of the greatest opportunities for us to do something like this because as we give thanks to God, we're remembering all the good things he's done for us. And so as we do the act of baptism this morning, we remember that it's not baptism that saves us, but instead to, to remember that baptism is simply a symbol of what God has already done in our lives, that as we come to receive Jesus and believe Jesus and turn our lives over to Jesus, that we obey Jesus by getting baptized as a symbol of being buried with him in his death and being raised to life uh, as we raise the person out of the water this morning. And so before we do our one and only baptism for Thanksgiving, I wanna bow us in a word of prayer real quick as we bless this moment. So please bow with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your deep love for us, expressed through the giving of your son Jesus, that in the midst of our worst possible moment as sinful people, that you loved us enough to trade your very best, your own son Jesus. And so we thank you for such good news. And so we celebrate that, we give thanks for that this morning. And as we bring down a brother in Christ who has come to believe you, who you worked in his life and have transformed his heart, Lord, we ask that you would bless him in this moment as we do this act of dedication and commitment, as we symbolize our obedience to you, that we died with you at the cross, our sin died with you, and that you raised us to life with you as well. And so we thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So today we have one baptism to perform for Thanksgiving and very excited. Uh, this brother, Jonathan Bow, grew up in our church. He is a longtime member, came up through our children's ministry as well as our youth ministry, has served faithfully in various capacities from uh, actually serving in our kids ministry for many years, as well as helping out with a lot of our AV production on Sunday mornings and uh, currently is a participant in one of our uh, Castro Valley growth groups. And so I wanna welcome down Jonathan Bow this morning. <laughs> this is dedication to Christ, going to sacrifice and suffer a little bit. So in the name of Jesus, you're enjoying this cold water. <laughs> so this morning church, what we're gonna do is I'm gonna ask Jonathan a few questions and hopefully he'll respond affirmatively. But I'm also gonna ask you as a church a question as well. So even though you're watching virtually, I want you to really participate because we as a church believe that it's not just about an individual, but that collectively, that we are the community of Christ. And so we want to be involved in Jonathan's commitment to Jesus. And so ask that you would also, even at home, respond affirmatively when I ask you a question, and then we're gonna baptize him. So Jonathan, how are you doing this morning? Um, great. Cold. <laughs> <laughs> this is in his act of taking up his cross and following Jesus today. <laughs> so we're very excited. And, uh, and later on, uh, after the service today, Jonathan is going to be sharing his testimony live on Zoom. And so please do tune, tune in for that as well. But Jonathan, I'm not trying to make you suffer, so I want to ask you a few questions this morning. Okay. First of all, I want to ask, do you, Jonathan Bow, confess that you are a sinner in need of God's grace? his forgiveness and his redemption in your life. Yes. And do you also <clears throat> believe that Jesus is the one and only son of God, that he came and lived a sinless life, that he died a sacrificial death on your behalf and then rose victoriously from the grave to be your savior? Yes. And do you also confess that Jesus Christ is your personal Lord and savior, that not only does he save you for eternity, but that he also rules and reigns as king over your life for all of eternity as well. Yes. Okay. And to the church, I want to ask you, are you, as the body of Christ, committed to supporting and nurturing Jonathan Bow through both his good times as well as through his trials to grow in maturity in his faith? Great answer, everybody. <laughs> okay, Jonathan, I'm going to pray for you and then we're going to baptize you. Okay. Heavenly Father, we thank you that your love for Jonathan extended before he was born the foundations of the earth, that you knew Jonathan, that you made him lovely in your image, that even in the midst of knowing that he would be sinful and fallen like the rest of us, that you had a plan for his life. And we thank you that in your deep love for him, that you already were calling him before he knew you. You were at work in his heart and his life. You were preparing all the steps of his days the situations and circumstances of his life were in your hands, driving him towards Jesus. So we thank you for the work of your Holy Spirit to help him recognize 
his deep need for you, that life apart from you was meaningless, and that life with you is our ultimate joy, our ultimate fulfillment. And we thank you that you made it possible through your son Jesus, calling him to become an adopted son, welcomed into your family forever. And so as we bow in this holy moment, we ask that you would guard Jonathan's heart and mind, that this isn't the end goal of his faith, but simply another stepping stone, a milestone, as he travels in obedience, in trust, and enjoyment of you for a lifetime and forever. And so we praise you for this testimony as we dip him into the water. We're reminded again of the goodness of Jesus who died on our behalf and who rose from the grave victoriously that we might have life forever as well. And so it's in his beautiful name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, Jonathan, I now baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so we welcome Jonathan officially into the fellowship of believers and into the family of Christ. So now that we've finished baptizing Jonathan, I want to officially present to you from our church an official certific certificate of baptism to recognize that uh, you were baptized this day, uh, November 20, 21, 2020, um, as a follower of Jesus and we accept you into full membership in our church as well. So congratulations, brother. Welcome to the family officially. Thank you. Okay, socially distant. <laughs> Thank you.
1 Chronicles 16, 8-10 O give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Good morning. We want to wish you a happy Thanksgiving, and thank you for joining us in worship. Uh, my name is Josh, and I am a pastor here. Uh, we are a church crossing generations and cultures together in Christ, and we would love for you to come and visit when we're able to safely resume gathering together in person. Meanwhile, <clears throat> you can greet each other online as our live comments are enabled on YouTube this morning. I'm going to take a moment to highlight some of our upcoming events here at The Crossing. And the first is a reminder to stay connected uh, during, especially the, during this shelter in place by joining a weekly group that meets online. Uh, we have groups serving every season of life. So for kids, we have Shining Stars on Friday nights, uh, Footprints also online Fridays for our youth, uh, Young Adult Ministry on Thursday nights and Mature Adults on Friday nights. And you can check the Get Connected section of our church website for all those days and times. And there's even an option for adults to sign up for a cross-generational missional growth group that meets online uh, throughout various days of the week. We want, want to remind you about our awesome church cookbook project. Uh, it's a way of bringing us together during this pandemic by getting everybody to contribute your favorite recipe to our church cookbook. And we definitely could use your help as the more recipes, the better. Uh, when we do compile this cookbook, we're going to uh, print out hard copies and all proceeds that we sell through our church will go to our new building fund. Now, <clears throat> the deadline for submission is today, so I want to really encourage you to, to pick out your favorite recipe and, and add it to our book so that uh, we can learn from you and, and be able to share delicious meals together. The details for uh, submitting those recipes can be found at our events page, and there is a link to our website cookbook page where you can submit recipes. Also want to thank you for joining us today for our special Thanksgiving worship and baptismal service. And afterwards, even after the service ends, uh, the party doesn't stop, but we're going to be hosting a celebration and testimonies at 1115 on Zoom. And so uh, I'll ask one of our uh, leaders to put that link uh, in the uh, comments section of our YouTube this morning. But would love for you to join us as Jonathan will be sharing his story uh, after getting baptized about how he became a follower of Jesus. And we want to spend some time encouraging him as well as maybe sharing some of your own stories of Thanksgiving this morning. So please do join us for that this short celebration that'll be uh, at 1115 on Zoom this morning. For those of you who do participate in a growth group uh, coming up on December the 15th, you can join us for a topical discussion for all the growth groups on speed friending. And that's going to be 8.30 p.m. on a Tuesday night via Zoom. We're also looking for people who are interested in serving in ministry. Uh, you can get involved with Shining Stars. This is our Friday night children's ministry, and we're in need of volunteers, especially more male leaders. And so we welcome those of you who love kids, who can conduct a Zoom small group every Friday night from 7.20 to 8.45 online, and be willing to do a monthly visit to kids in your small group. And that commitment uh, only lasts until the end of the school year, um, June of 2021. And so if you're interested, we would love to have you consider serving in our children's ministry on Friday nights, and you can contact Lisa Ko, who is our children's ministry director, for more information. And her phone number and email are available on uh, the announcements that have been sent out to you. As you know, uh, this year, we can't collect canned and dried foods for Alameda County Community Food Bank, uh, as we as a state have moved back, for the most part, into the purple tier restrictions with uh, coronavirus cases. And so we wanna encourage you to help out our community by donating directly. Uh, you can do so by sending a check to ACCFB and the address is in, on our events page, or you can donate directly online to Alameda Community County Food Bank. And once again, the link for that is on our events page um, at our church website. On a more personal note, you can help local families in our Hayward area. And there's four ways that you can help support uh, families this, this year. One is you can pray for families in our community. Uh, you can help fund 
the uh, purchase of groceries for them. You could help shop for groceries, or you could help deliver groceries to local families in the Hayward area. And so if you're interested in getting involved, you can contact Lori Campbell for more information. And just to give you some idea, we've already made over 190 deliveries uh, since uh, the beginning of summer, and people have given more than $27,000 in home essentials to families uh, in our community as the blessing of Christ. So I want to applaud you and, um, and challenge you to, to get even more involved as uh, we want to be the, the blessing of Jesus and the gospel to our local community. Now, there's a lot of things you can be praying for during this season. Obviously, continue praying for relief from the coronavirus as um, cases have spiked throughout California and across the nation. Continue building, uh, praying for our new building construction and funding. And as you've seen every Friday at our church Facebook page, uh, Anna uh, Mora, our admin assistant, posts new photos of what's been developing uh, during the construction. Please continue praying for our youth pastor search as we are um, right in the middle of that process. And of course, pray for Jonathan Bow as he's been newly baptized. And uh, that's not the end goal of just simply getting baptized, but a, uh, an, another milestone, a step in his continuing lifelong journey with Jesus. And do continue praying for our Merge Family Adult Ministry, which is the focal ministry for this month, as we want to encourage them and support them as a church body in prayer. And lastly, please do pray for our church missionaries, uh, Vanir and Aijan, uh, who are missionaries in the Middle East. There was a major earthquake in recent weeks in their area, and they are spearheading as, um, as the body of Christ uh, relief efforts right there in the Middle East. And to give you some idea, to give you an update, our church has supported them uh, over $3,500 towards earthquake relief. And uh, you as a church through them have donated 99 coats uh, for men, 99 coats for women, over 3,100 units of clean drinking water, and 250 meals. And so I want to continue asking for your prayer as uh, we uh, extend the reach and the blessing of Jesus, not only locally, but globally as well. And if you haven't uh, remembered anything that I've said this morning, you can always go to our events page at our church website at thecrossing.cfcchayward.org, or you can go to the Crossing's Facebook page uh, where we post the announcements every Tuesday, as well as additional content every day. Uh, to continue enriching your spiritual walk. And so we would love for you to be able to uh, continue getting connected and, and especially during this time that, that we as a church body want to uh, be as connected as we can uh, through these trying times. Now I'm going to bow us in a word of prayer before we dive into the word of God this morning. So would you bow with me in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, what a fantastic season as we celebrate celebrated Thanksgiving this past week, we're reminded once again to turn our hearts back towards you, to remember and reflect on how good the Lord is to us. And yet, 2020 has been an incredibly trying year uh, from all the issues surrounding the pandemic to political upheaval and social unrest, a lot of our personal struggles. It's been a difficult season at times. And so we ask humbly that you would speak to us this morning, that you would give us encouragement, that you would minister to us through your word, that we would know that you are near to us, that we would know that you are here with us. And so we love you and we give thanks to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. I want to start off this morning by asking you a question. If you were to describe your life as some kind of punctuation mark, what would it be? For example, all of us have lives that are filled with question marks at times. What do I need to do? Where do I need to go? How much does it cost? And so we all need information to handle our decisions and our responsibilities in our daily life. But for many of us, a question mark is the defining feature of our lives. Why did this terrible thing happen to me? How am I going to get through this? Where do I go next? And so we find that our lives can be dominated by a question mark of uncertainty or anxiety. If only I could get an answer to this question, then I might have some sense of control in my life. For some of us, it's like, wow, you pack a lot of stuff into the sentence of your life. But if you're not careful, 
the defining mark of your life could be a comma. What I mean is you might, might become known as the person who is always moving on to the next thing, focused on the next acquisition or vacation, playing the next game or watching the next show, all focused on the next item on my to-do list or on my bucket list, focused on the next rung of the ladder of my career. Now we all have stuff that needs our attention, but we don't wanna be remembered as that person who is so busy and so self-absorbed that we only connect with other people in the brief pauses, in the commas of our run-on sentence lives. And then for some of us, our lives are punctuated with a period, a full stop. Now, it's important for us to regularly rest and reflect and enjoy life, but it's tragic when our lives are brought to a complete halt that perhaps you've experienced something so painful in your past that you're never able to move forward. There's this immovable period that marks the page of your life. I've met younger people, people and older people who are imprisoned by the pains of their past that what lays behind me defines me. And so I'm never able to truly write a new sentence since then. I'm never able to see that God is not yet done writing my story. So I wonder what the people closest to you would say is the punctuation mark of your life. The uncertainty of a question mark, the distractions of a constant comma, comma, comma or the paralysis of a period. Now, we experience all three of these things throughout our lives, but when they take over, when they take control of our lives, it reveals that our lives might be written in the story of discontent. Why, God? What is gonna happen to me next? Or, I can't seem to fill the emptiness of my soul, so I keep going and going and going. Or, I lost, the life I used to have, that I should have had, and now it's over, period. It's easy to be trapped in these places of discontent, when, especially in our world today where there's a chorus of anxiety and busyness and emptiness everywhere that we look. And so there are many times that we're haunted by a past that's gone wrong or a present that's impossible to fix or a future that may never be the same again. And that is why it's so important for followers of Jesus to choose purposefully, even painstakingly, to punctuate the story of our lives with the exclamation point of thanksgiving. And this is a practice that's been handed down to us throughout biblical history. Now, if you're familiar with the story of Israel, you know how much of their lives were filled with the same punctuation marks as ours. They suffered more than enough oppression and loss to have plenty of question marks. They journeyed on and on through the wilderness, their lives commoded by the relentless series of battles and breakdowns that they faced again and again and again. And there were times when they came to a full stop against the seas or against a mountain that seemed uncrossable or against a fortress or a foe that seemed unbeatable. And so their lives were punctuated with seasons of deep discontent and despair. But there is one saving grace that kept their hopes alive. Time and again, we see them pause on their path. They'll stop for a moment, purposefully raise their eyes to heaven, and then give thanks to God. And so we'll see here this morning in 1 Chronicles chapter 16, we get a picture of such an exclamation point in the life of Israel. So if you have a Bible, you want to turn there to 1 Chronicles chapter 16 in the Old Testament. Now, at this point in history, the controversial reign of King Saul is over. And a young warrior named David comes onto the scene, and he's been elected by prophetic designation and popular acclamation to be the next king. And so he's led the armies of Israel against the Philistines again and again and again. And now at this point, they've captured the ancient Acropolis, the city of Jerusalem, the crown jewel of Canaan up on, this, um, up on the hills. And so they pause between the busyness and the battles that they've been experiencing, not only to catch their collective breath, 
but to mark this moment with an exclamation point. So what happens is David orders the Ark of the Covenant. If you don't know what that is, that's this large box that contains the stone tablets of God's law, those two stone tablets. It contains Aaron's priestly staff and this cup of manna of bread that, that God gave to the Israelites from heaven while they were wandering throughout the wilderness. And this Ark of the Covenant is a symbol of their relationship, the covenant relationship between Israel and God. And so atop this box was a mercy seat that would manifest the very presence of the living God, that he was with them. And so David orders this Ark of the Covenant to be brought up to the new capital city, up the hill, up to the mountain, so that they can worship and celebrate the Lord. And as David leads this procession into the city, he's literally dancing with joy in front of the ark as it's carried in. So let's pick up the story there in 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 1. And they brought in the ark of, the, uh, the ark of God and set it inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And they offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before God. And when David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord and distributed to all Israel, both men and women, to each a loaf of bread, a portion of meat, and a cake of raisins. Then he appointed some of the Levites as ministers before the ark of the Lord to invoke, to thank, and to praise the Lord, the God of Israel. So let's stop right there for a moment. As the nation of Israel gathers together in celebration, it's not just to celebrate their new victory or their new king or their new capital city. But we see here in verses one through three that the Ark of the Covenant, the very presence of God, is being placed into a new tabernacle tent, a new center of worship and life for the nation, right in the midst of their political capital. And so the priests, the, the people who serve the Lord, they made these burnt offerings. And the burnt offerings are for the sins of the people. And then they also gave a peace offering to God. And that's a symbol of having peace with God by enjoying a meal with God as a way of giving thanks to God. And so that's why David blesses the people by distributing a meal to every person and every family that just as some of you these past few weeks have distributed food to our neighbors in Hayward so that they can enjoy a meal together and give thanks to God. That's what a peace offering is for, giving thanks for the peace we have with God. Then David appoints some Levitical priests, some men from the tribe of Levi to serve as priests to be worship leaders. And their job in verse four is to invoke, to give thanks, to praise the Lord, the God of Israel, it says. In other words, verse four is saying that some of them were lifting up all the prayer requests of the people. Some of them were to list all the reasons that they can think of to be thankful to God. And then the rest of them made music with I don't know, guitars and keyboards and drums or whatever the ancient Near East equivalent of their musical instruments might be. And so what you see happening here is this is a Thanksgiving worship service. And did you know at this very first Thanksgiving in Jerusalem that David gave to the world this very famous Psalm with this now famous line that you see in verse 34, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. And so the big idea of the passage this morning is that just like the Israelites, whatever troubles you and I are facing, that we overcome life's punctuation marks of discontent with the biblical practice of thanksgiving. What we mean is, you see, these exclamation points are ingrained into the story of Israel. From the time that they first fled slavery and death in Egypt, they learned to stop along their journey to give thanks to God. And in many places, you'll see that they would pile up these stones, these memorial stones into big piles to mark where they particularly were conscious of God's blessing given to them. And so they would bring special offerings. They would bring special sacrifices as a way of saying, thank you, Lord for your protection, for your provision, for your presence in our lives. Now, as we talk about this, though, you should be saying, well, what about those times, though, when I don't feel like I have much to be thankful for? What about those times when I can't see God and his goodness in my life? 
Verse 7. Then on that day, David first appointed that thanksgiving be sung to the Lord by Asaph and his brothers. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Let's stop there for a moment. So David penned this psalm for people to gather together and sing together to give thanks to their mighty God by, it says in verse 7, making, or verse 8, making known his deeds amongst the peoples. That means that in order to give thanks, we're meant to gather together and speak aloud to one another what God has done for us. And so you might remember in Israel's history that they struggled through years of external oppression and internal division. And you'll see later in chapter 18 that there's still more wars for them to fight. So before there's a lot of challenges. And then in the future, there's more challenges for them to face. And it would be easy for them to focus on the overwhelming challenges and needs of life and to lose sight of if God is good or whether God is present. But what thankfulness does is thankfulness plucks the rubble from our eyes so that you and I can see God clearly. And so by proclaiming the faithfulness of yesterday helps us to see beyond the circumstances of today to give us hope for tomorrow. And what we see in this passage is that giving thanks isn't generic. We don't just say thank you for the weather, thanks for the day, thanks for our friends, that there's something powerful that happens as you and I recount to one another specifically what God has done for us. It's this ongoing practice of beating back doubt and despair of yesterday's periods, of today's commas, and tomorrow's questions. So for example, as we celebrated our socially distant Thanksgiving celebrations, each in our own homes and with our uh, small social bubbles, I would guess, I was having a conversation last night with my son, my son, Indy. He's seven years old. And to be honest, he was struggling a little bit as we were praying before his bedtime. He was sharing with me that, uh, like when I asked him about how he felt about Thanksgiving this year, that it was kind of disappointing that he can't go to Ahmad's house. He's used to going to uh, his grandmother's house where all of his uncles and aunts and all of his cousins gathered together for this madhouse of Thanksgiving celebration. But this year, I can't go to Amma's house. I can't go to church and play with friends. I can't go to school, but he wasn't really super disappointed about that. But in his mind, when he looks at this year and thinking about Thanksgiving, all he can see is the disappointments. And so we continued having a conversation, kind of reminding each other, do you remember that when church closed, that God provided a way that that very week that we couldn't have people gather together and be a family in Christ together, that God still provided a way that week for us to be able to worship together online, that when his school closed, that God still provided a way for him to be able to learn and still see some of his school friends online, that even though being stuck at home is difficult, and sometimes it's hard being around each other all the time, and we bicker a lot, and sometimes a lot of our personal ugliness comes to the surface, and yet God has been humbling daddy at least and teaching me a little bit about my weaknesses and how to be a better husband or a better father, even in my moments of weaknesses. And even though things have been hard, that these memories that we have of having time together are precious. We reminded him that, you know, even though we can't knock on people's doors to do outreach as a church anymore, yet God has opened the door for us to provide mobile Wi-Fi spots for our school, groceries for our neighbors, a drive through Halloween for our community. And so it's, <clears throat> we continued sharing all the things that God has continued doing. His eyes start to light up a little bit and his prayers started to change as he could see specifically, tangibly, and clearly that God is here the whole time, that he's been so good to us. So King David, he established this tradition to carry on not only as a nation and the capital city, but in the homes of God's people, as leaders of their families would stand in their homes and recite in detail the record of God's provision and his providence over their long history as a nation, which is what we see happening in verses eight through 34. That 
It, they would gather the tribes together and hold a feast where God is the honored guest and everyone around their table would exclaim, would make, make exclamation points about how good and how glorious God is. And what it does is it both exalts God, but it also recenters our perspective. It reminds us that as hard as life can be, that they're richly blessed. And they'd remember that they'd gotten this far on life's journey, not by their own genius or their own merit or their own effort, but by the unearned grace of God, the favor of God poured out on them. And then as they shouted these exclamations of thanksgiving, they would receive clarity again that God is profoundly active along their journey. So that for the road ahead, no matter how bumpy, no matter how many challenges, that, that they had every reason to believe if we will continue to trust in him, that we would experience his faithfulness again ahead of us. So I want you to think about where does our tradition of Thanksgiving come from? That we celebrated as a nation this past week. Now, you might remember the settlers the, in Plymouth, they practiced this pattern from the example of the ancient Israelites. You might know the story that they fled persecution in England. 102 pilgrims spent 66 days crossing the rough seas of the Atlantic. And when they arrived here on the shores of North America, they faced horrific challenges. Over half of the group died from exposure, from malnutrition, from disease that first brutal winter. It raised serious question marks about God's providence. Those who survived found their lives filled with commas as they rapidly moved from one problem to the next problem. We need to build better shelters for next winter. We need to scrounge enough food to eat. We need to cultivate the land. It's exhausting. Some of them gave up hope, period. Even some of them, even boarding a ship, starting to leave to return to England. But that spring, by the sovereignty of God, they were surprised by a Native American who spoke English to them. This man named Squanto had been kidnapped and enslaved and was uh, sent over to Spain as a slave. He escaped to England and was able to return with an ex exploratory expedition. Now this Native American man, he could have been, he should have been rightfully bitter, but instead, by the grace of God, he showed compassion. He taught these colonists how to cultivate corn, how to catch fish, how to avoid certain poisonous plants. And he helped them to forge an alliance with the Wampanoag tribe that actually endured for over 50 years a peace between these, colon these pilgrims and the Native American tribe that was nearby. By the grace of God, they persevered. And so as this second winter crept in, after their first successful harvest of corn, Governor Will Bradford proclaimed in November of 1621 that they should cease their striving, gather together as a community, invite their native neighbors, and raise an exclamation point of thanksgiving to God in a festival that lasted over three days. It's been about 400 years since that day in Plymouth, more than 3,000 years since that day in Jerusalem, but the capacity of God's people to handle the uncertainty of questions with courage and with wisdom, the unrelenting demands between the commas of life, the inevitable periods when our hope seems finished still flows from our relationship with Jesus today. And so I wanna ask you, how are you punctuating your life today? The Israelites gathered to celebrate God's victory and his king and his capital, this new center of life and worship where the presence of God would dwell with them through the Ark of the Covenant. And we continue that tradition as we give thanks, celebrating God's victory over sin and suffering and Satan and death through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And as we place our hope, our trust, and our lives into his hands, we come to recognize that he is our our true king, our ultimate king that we're celebrating, that he brings a new kingdom, that he draws us into the very presence of God through his blood, 
through his sacrifice so that we can also worship and joy and experience life forever with the living God. So whatever trials are behind you or before you, remember to overcome discontent by punctuating your life with the exclamation point of thanksgiving. As we dwell on what God has done for us in Jesus, give thanks. It is the ongoing practice of beating back the darkness, of standing defiantly and joyfully against despair of yesterday's periods, of today's commas, against tomorrow's questions, because we know that he is faithful. And so we know where our hope is. If we know the faithfulness of the past, we can trust him for the hope of our futures. And by telling each other what God has specifically done for us, we're plucking the rubble of our circumstances from our eyes so that we can see him much more clearly. And so here's my invitation for you today. I want us to continue with thanksgiving around the table tonight, that perhaps you might bring the word of God to your table and read aloud First Chronicles chapter 16, and then go around your table or around your Zoom room this, this evening and share what words come alive for you and why from this passage. And then, now here's the point, share your exclamation points of gratitude to God of, for what he has done for us, for our gift of life, on this remarkable planet, for the people you love and who have loved you, for his resources that bless you, for his word that guides you, for his grace that forgives you, for his mercy that preserves you, for his eternal arms that await you. Whatever comes to mind or pours from your heart today, stop and give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. And his love endures forever. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the beauty of your word. That during this Thanksgiving season, we don't just shout generic thanks to the, to the void of heaven. We don't just come before you and celebrate our personal gluttony or just a break from life. <coughs> no, instead we give thanks to the great Lord of heaven and earth who loved us enough to send his own son that he might be the sacrifice for our sins, cleansing us and bringing us into peace with you. And so we want to give you a peace offering today, one where we enjoy a meal with you, one where we give thanks to you, one where we encourage each other by reminding each other of all the things that you have done for us. And as we do so, Lord, may your word and your encouragement remind us again that no matter how big our circumstances may seem that your hands by far are much bigger that you are the god of heaven and earth that you have always been there for us you are always here with us that you have always been faithful to us and so may we proclaim once again that we would give thanks to you our lord for you are good and your steadfast love endures forever amen Mercy never fails me, and all my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every 
breath that I am able oh, I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice You have led me through the fire and darkest night you are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend Oh, I have been In the goodness of God All my life you have been faithful all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing the goodness of God Your goodness is running after, it's running after me your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will see of the goodness of God all my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God I will sing of the goodness of God. And now we'll have a time of free will offering. Um, if this is your first time tuning in or you're just checking us out, don't feel obligated to give. Uh, but just sing along with this last song. Um, if you do want to give, you can find the information on our church's website. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me I was lost but he brought me in Oh his love for me Oh his love for me Who the sun sets free Oh it's free indeed I'm a child of God Yes, I am. Free at last, He has ransomed me. His grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, He died for me. Who the Son sets free. Oh, it's free 
a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I. to receive a blessing from the Lord this morning. <clears throat> Excuse me. From 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 23 to 34. This is a long one. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And he is to be held in awe above all gods, for all the gods of the people are just idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his place. Ascribe to the Lord, O clans of the peoples, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory to his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice and let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. 
for his steadfast love endures forever. Amen. Thank you for joining us in worship this morning. Uh, we've left the link for the uh, Zoom meeting to, to have our Thanksgiving celebration continue. And since uh, we're done a few minutes early, we'll open up the Zoom, re uh, Zoom room a little bit early for you. So come and hang out with us. Uh, we'll try to open it up for you by 11 o'clock. So come and hang out with us for a little while, and then we'll get started uh, sharing some stories of God's goodness to one another. Thank you for joining us, and see you soon. <laughs>